Steve here. That's quite interesting when you think back to a year and a half ago when uh, he was deported from Australia because he refused to take the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, he was embroiled in a more controversy during the Australian Open this year when his father was photographed with somebody holding a flag with Vladimir Putin's face on it, although he said that that was really coincidental and he didn't know it had got that image on it. And the fact is, he won that tournament. And he's often won tournaments when things have been a little bit contentious around him. He does seem to be able to cope with all of it. So I don't necessarily think he is drawing a line because I think it's also something he feels very passionate about. That was BBC tennis commentator David Law talking about Novak Djokovic's reaction to his decision to ride on the camera lens. Kosovo is the heart of Serbia. Stop the violence. Novak Djokovic saying it is his belief and he doesn't think he'll ever have a drama-free Grand Slam. In fact, he says it drives him. Fascinating.
Prime Minister Rose Jackson says the government's not forgotten rural and regional communities after a constitutional change that protects drinking water and underwater from privatisation. The amendment doesn't allow for the same protection for the state's water resources in the regional areas, which are administered differently. But parliamentary inquiry will now look at how best to look after those assets. Ms Jackson says the amendment means any future New South Wales government won't be able to. Andrew McCallum from the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry says the decision will add millions of dollars in costs to the supply chain. From a business point of view, uh, we are disappointed. We are concerned with the decision that the Commission has uh, brought down. 5.75% uh, uh, plus 0.5% uh, increase in the superannuation guarantee. Uh, this will add significantly to costs for business. Uh, we estimate it will mean an extra $12.6 billion uh, in costs into the supply chain. Uh, this will impact particularly small businesses the most. They are the ones who end up paying these award uh, wages. Uh, it will mean for them that this adds to pressure, which is already intense uh, as a result of significantly higher costs that they've been facing through the supply chain, through energy prices, and now uh, through wages. Our other concern is that it adds further to the pressure on inflation. It means that they have not followed the guidance that the Reserve Bank has provided in recent weeks, including here in Parliament House uh, in the past week. Uh, our concern is that it increases the pressure uh, or maintains the pressure on interest rates uh, in the months ahead.
Castle Hill in Sydney's northwest. Despite his initial optimism, he claims the panels have been a disappointment. He's especially unhappy about the feed-in tariff he received of five cents for every unit of excess power in solar panels and pumps back into the system. By comparison, he says he's paying more than 30 cents per kilowatt hour by electricity from the grid. In terms of the return on investment is pretty poor. We're effectively subsidizing these large power companies who are, in my view, ripping us off uh, by getting cheap power and then selling it back to us at a highly inflated price. Across Australia, feed-in tariffs have plunged in recent years as the number of households with solar panels has exploded. Sarah McNamara is the boss of the Australian Energy Council. She denies that solar customers are being ripped off, noting energy providers have to account for costs, including generation, coal suppliers, government policy and retail. When feed-in tariffs were first proposed by different states, um, they were uh, excessively generous. They represented an amount well in excess of the actual value of the electricity that was being fed back into the grid. Now that was done really to encourage people to put solar PV onto their roofs. That's been extremely successful. Australia has the highest penetration of domestic solar PV of, of any country on Earth. It's a view shared by Alison Brown, University of New South Wales. He says the case of rooftop solar is still extremely strong, but there is a caveat. The biggest game when you're putting rooftop solar in is that if you can be generating electricity in the middle of the day and use it in the middle of the day, then shift as much of your load to you use your own solar, and that's going to be the best way to help pay back your system uh, fairly quickly. Professor Sprout says electricity is different to other commodities in that supply has to match demand almost perfectly at all times. He says storage such as batteries and pumped hydro plants will become more accessible, but in the meantime, the daily glut of solar power will play on electricity prices and feeding tariffs. In terms of how this all works out, how does the grid behave, how will customers behave, how do, how do we operate the whole system? Australia's at the cutting edge. That was Professor Alistair Brown with the University of New South Wales, ending that report from Daniel Mercer. You're listening to ABC News Radio. I'm Tom Young Weinstein. And making news today, the Fair Work Commission has handed down its annual decision on awards and minimum wages. From July 1, the minimum wage and award rates will increase by 5.75%. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has met with China's Deputy Foreign Minister and other top diplomats from the BRICS block of the Belgian economy. The BRICS members currently include Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. And the U.S. Consumer and Financial Protection Bureau is warning customers of online payment platforms do not store their money in the app and the funds that might not be safe. There follows recent bank failures which were uninsured. Depositors still on bank run in Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and First Republic Bank. Now to that big dismissal of the defamation case brought by war veteran Ben Robert Smith against the three newspapers. The Victoria Cross recipient had sued the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, The Canberra Times, and three journals in the federal court for a series of stories published in 2018. He said they falsely contained a false allegation rather of war crimes in Afghanistan, bullying of his former Special Air Service Regiment colleagues, and domestic violence. However, a federal court judge dismissed the case, finding almost all of the allegations made were substantially or contextually true. It's important to note that this was a civil case with no criminal crimes. Kevin Lynch is a partner at Johnson Winter and Flattery, special defamation and media law. There's no finding of guilt in this case because it is a civil case. It's a case brought by Ben Robert Smith against another set of entities, the publishers, and that was effectively to say that they defamed him. And in order to defend that, the uh, publishers established successfully either truth or contextual truth to the allegations that they made. So they made allegations that he'd killed unarmed and defenseless Afghan civilians, that he bullied that he um, had uh, been involved in acts of domestic violence and these um, allegations were seriously defended as truth or as contextual truth but it's not a criminal proceeding uh, there's no finding of guilt it's not a war crimes tribunal and the different standard that you're talking about there is that when you have to defend yourself